would add to that as well when we teach this course, one of the things that students comment on the most is the impact of the lived experience stories and the inclusion of those particular case studies. That's really what they take away as being the key learning for them. You can see the people through the stories, right? And you can see the challenges. It just brings them to life. It's time for a new episode of o OE Global Voices, the podcast we produce here at Open Education Global. It's May 23rd at 11 a.m. on the East Coast, where my guests are coming from. Each episode of this podcast, we share you conversation style, people, practices, ideas from open educators from around the world. It's been quite some time since we announced the winners of the Open Education Awards for Excellence. Well, actually it was way back in August of last year. We have in our studio a team representing a fabulous project and we're continuing into 2020 work to the catch up with our award winner. Often it provides an opportunity to find out what has happened with their project since that time of the award. And it's also timely because we have nominations open for the next round of the awards. We hope these conversations will motivate our listeners to nominate someone to be in this position next year. So in this show, we're going to hear from a few of many collaborators on an OER, Understanding Homelessness in Canada from the Street to the Classroom, which won the award for Significant Impact OER. As we listen and welcome our guests into our home here on the air, I think you're going to get a sense this project could have also gotten the collaboration award and maybe every other award in the, the set. I, I want to welcome everybody. We have to do introductions and we, we have uh, five guests here. So I think I'll start and I'll call on Stephanie first and then she can pass the baton. So welcome, Stephanie. I've been talking too much. Let's hear your voice. Yeah, thanks so much. My voice, hopefully it's fairly normal. I've been sick for the last week and a half. So I apologize if it's a little rusty, but I'm an e-learning designer with Trent University and I'm from Peterborough. And how about next? Say hello. Please, James. We have two here. James Bailey. I'm a person with lived experience in homelessness and currently am an intensive case manager with the opiate team at Four Counties Addiction Services team in Peterborough. Excellent. Welcome, James. And then I'll turn it over to Christy. Oh, I didn't even answer. I'll probably butcher your name, Christy. It's Christy Boo Cherry. So I always say, think of a ghost, think of a cherry, Boo Cherry. I am an associate professor of sociology at Trent University, and I also have been overseeing our criminology program. I am just outside of Toronto in the Durham region, and joining me today as well is my trusty cat, Autumn, who you can't see but is sitting on my lap as she was during every recording for this particular project. Autumn is a team member, and my dog Felix will probably jump at some point. And then we'll go over to Cindy. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you. My name is Cindy Gilmer, and I am a nursing professor at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. I live on the traditional territory of the Mississauga, Anishinaabeg, and the territory covered by the Williams Treaty down in Port Hope, Ontario, on beautiful Lake Ontario. And then we also have in the studio with us James Bailey. Welcome, James. Hi there. Um, my name is James Bailey. I am a multimedia e-learning design specialist that works at Trent Online. Stephanie and I actually work quite closely together, and I also live in Peterborough, Ontario. Fantastic. So how did you all come to be working together on this project? What's the story of the origin? No, well, Christy, you have to answer that one. Yeah, this is a, an interesting story and I guess came together just by sheer chance and luck. We had just started a new criminology program at Trent University. As part of that, we were planning on having a course in homelessness, and we wanted to do that online. So at the same time, during COVID, the Ontario government released a virtual learning strategy, which had some funding tied to course development. And so we applied for funding. We received that and decided to think about developing the course, doing it in a way that would be engaging and accessible uh, and open. We had group conversations and decided we would reach out to some researchers and get their opinions on what they thought should be included in the course. Through these conversations, we said, well, if we're already talking to researchers, why don't we record those? Why don't we embed them? And then that turned into the talking textbook, that turned into a video series, it turned into a podcast, and really just became this grand multimedia mixed approach that readers, listeners, viewers can access from a range of different perspectives. And so it was really having a group of people in the room doing what they do best. 
So everybody brought their particular skill set. And through our conversations together, we went from this idea from let's do a chorus to let's do this huge project that has exploded in the best possible way. Did Christy cover everything there? She didn't uh, cover her brilliance in coming up with the initial uh, idea and her ability to go, what do you think? And people to go, yeah, we're in. Yeah, that's very important. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, Canadian Observatory on, on Homelessness, because um, that's a, obviously a very important entity. I think probably I'm best positioned to speak about the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness because they are where I did my doctoral training um, and have a long relationship with. They are based at York University. They are led by Dr. Stephen Gates. Essentially, they're a partnership between researchers, um, policymakers, people with lived experience, frontline workers, trying to move the needle, essentially, on homelessness and trying to shift towards prevention. They do that through knowledge mobilization, through education, through um, advocacy. And so we worked with them as a whole, but in particular with Steph Vasco, their senior director of communications, to draw on their resources and embed them into the book. Likewise, they've used the book as the basis for some of their training on their learning hub. And so that's where the relationship came in and really was mutually beneficial because we could draw on their resources. And they also can use the material that we created to help advance their education aims. Obviously, the category significant impact OER because of the importance of this issue. Like in 2024, there's stories across the nation of the cost of housing, and it's making the, the situation even worse. What are you seeing regionally now? What's the state of homelessness um, in Ontario? I work closely with a population who are homeless in Peterborough, and a lot of it is the escalating cost of housing compared to social assistance, for instance, who will pay a combination of basic needs and housing allowance at 733 a month which doesn't cover the cost of even uh, securing housing. So basically it's a recipe for homelessness and we're seeing a lot of people who are on social assistance who are homeless, a lot of seniors who are on social assistance who are homeless or living in shelters in their senior years. I think it touches every community. Certainly it's not just an urban challenge. You often see the picture of homelessness with a person lying on a, a grate in the winter trying to stay warm. I live in a more, more rural community, and every community is touched by what some of the literature calls hidden homelessness, especially at this time of year. You start to see folks who are camping on the beach, beach. and who just can't find affordable housing, and the income, even from government, is just not cutting it. It's, it's not cutting it for housing, let alone when you're deciding whether you or your children are going to eat this week as well. So it's it's pretty pretty rampant across Ontario, and my understanding is that that's fairly typical for the whole country. Very true, definitely. Where I am in, in Saskatchewan as well, it's not just a city issue. One of the most compelling features that I saw in the book was the use of the scenarios and, and the video stories. Initially, there were some ideas for interviews, but how you went about it and how you dealt with the challenge to ask someone, especially who has lived homelessness, to share their experience. And so how did you set that up to be a comfortable act to be able to ask someone to put their story out there. So for the scenarios, they're sort of composite work. The scenarios took into account real folks' stories that were gathered primarily from Nicole and James, our two lived experience experts. We wanted them to ring true and not be trite, what you might think of first, but that they would come across as real people. So it's that experience of the two outreach workers out in the community talking to folks, combining stories. And at the end of the day, I think that the touchstone was when, you know, either Nicole or James go, oh, my goodness, I think I know that person, even though mm -hmm. it was a composite, right, that, that it rang really true. Um, for the scenario piece, that was that work out in the community pulling together uh, information. And then for the artwork that we had, again, James and Nicole reached out to the community and had folks who, who were interested in sharing their story through art. And so we had got some wonderful original art that, you know, was quite impactful as well to, to be able to include. I would add to that as well. When we teach this course, one of the things that students comment on the most is the impact of the lived experience stories and the inclusion 
of those particular case studies, that's really what they take away as being the key learning for them. You can see the people through the stories, right? And you can see the challenges. It just brings them to life. When you set out with an audience in mind, can you touch on who you were thinking this would address and be useful to? I guess, obviously, teaching situations, but to me, it's written to be a lot broader. Yeah, initially, we had set out with the idea of making it specifically a course tied to this program at Trent University. And we looked at some technical issues that emerged, like, well, if we're using it at Trent University, we have a specific LMS, so we use Blackboard. But if we wanted to make it open and accessible to other universities, if they don't use Blackboard, it may not transfer the same. And so shout out to Terry Green, who said, why don't you use Pressbook? And so that's how we really got into using Pressbook as the platform. And that opened up the avenue for us to be able to say, well, what can we integrate into here? We can use uh, YouTube and we can use Spreaker as the podcast. And so that, I think, opened up the audience by nature of just what we could do and who we could reach. Well, we started out again with this sort of small idea. With the tools at our disposal, we were able to open it up and say, let's open this conversation beyond the classroom. That's one of the things I think that we talked about in the title was initially the title was, or the subtitle was from the classroom to the streets. And Nicole said, why don't we make it from the street to the classroom? And so we thought that made a lot more sense. And I can add to that with the layout, we, we did look at different disciplines because we're thinking about classroom level. We spoke with different experts on different disciplines. We collected research or uh, references and information. We've had folks, for example, in nursing who've just used one or two of the modules. I'm on a board of directors for a hospital, and they were wanting to learn something about homelessness. So we shared the link to the book. Many of the directors who are living in a community where they see homelessness, but they only hear the community voice of the community thinks homelessness is, it was a, a, a nice reference and an, a, an ability to, to become a little bit more knowledgeable about what the research says about homelessness, what, the, what these experts say about homelessness, including our lived experience experts say about homelessness. So it's broadened quite significantly. And so for your collaborators who have the lived experiences, do they feel like it, it really gives a sense about what it's like or what the population should know about being homeless? Being homeless isn't safe. And I'm not that far out of, of my lived experience in homelessness it's within the last 10 years. And you don't rest, you don't sleep. You're constantly on alert. It, it's dangerous situations, not a pleasant existence, and you do what you can to stay safe. I don't know what else to say. Not a place to be. In addition to James's comments, my local anti-poverty homelessness support agency, Greenwood Coalition, of which Nicole Whitmore was one of our collaborators. They've been using the book as well. Nicole comments because of her input to recognize the trueness of the uh, case studies. She does comment about how supportive that is for the real world, if you will. Thank you, Cindy. What have you heard back from, in terms of feedback from other people, organizations, institutions who may have adopted this? Do you get a lot of feedback on the OER? We have an email address and a contact form in there, and we have an option for people to fill out a review form and also just to contact us directly. We have heard from a number of people who have used it, who have adopted it, who have been teaching it. I think it has spread far and wide and perhaps much further than we expected. I was pulling some figures this morning, and I asked James to pull some of our podcast figures as well to go along with it. For instance, we have... 751 listeners to our podcast, 15,229 views on our YouTube videos, mm. and over 31,000 readers. And the countries are broad. We have Canada, U.S., Australia, U.K., New Zealand, Pakistan, Japan, South Africa, Germany, China, India, Philippines, Singapore. goes on. That's just a list of some of them. But I think that it is picking up and it is going farther than we expected. We had targeted Canada, but it does seem like there's perhaps an interest and a need to have these conversations more globally. Uh, I love the idea that you have a podcast going along with this. What was the decision to do that? And can you give us a sense about what you include in your podcast episodes? Maybe I can speak to this a little bit. So 
to take a step back for a moment, in total, all the videos that we have for this project is 271. Basically, we took all of our interviewers, cut up all the clips into individual questions, and then created videos, 271 videos, around each specific question. As we were moving through this project, we had an idea. We said, hey, why don't we make this accessible for auditory learners? Why don't we have that availability as part of the project? So I, of course, agreed to this idea. And we came up with a little bit of scripting, began to shape. We had Cindy actually do a intro and a outro narration. We had her introduce each interviewer. And then from there, we were able to kind of craft and use the audio from each video into podcast episodes. So the podcast themselves are more or less a reflection of the videos, just in a much longer format. The organization of the book in general, like come about as a design process. There is a really consistent structure that I admire in each chapter. I guess oh, so I'm the e-learning designer, I'll take that one. But yeah, it was definitely, again, a team effort. Christy would do these beautiful drafts and basically I would try to turn them into these book chapters. It's really important for me that there is consistency in the format and the layout because as Cindy said some people might just take one chapter and they're not seeing all of the book at once so I want them to be able to jump into the chapter that's relevant to them and it speak for itself that's what I really love about this book it's addressing a very serious issue but it doesn't read like an academic journal article that's important to own right but it's not going to reach as many people as this can, right? It's designed to be attractive to a uh, broader group of people. It's all about understanding homelessness. People see it, it is everywhere, but people make their own judgments. Are those judgments based on reality, like facts? The more that they can explore and access resources like this that are open, then the more they can actually understand it and become more maybe compassionate and maybe more helpful to finding to, to this issue. And now looking back on it, do you sometimes say like, oh, we should have done this or I'd really like to add this. Or, and is there any updates yeah. in the future happening? As far as like wishing we'd done more, I mean, Christy kind of touched on this noble effect, but I would describe it more like an avalanche, a beautiful avalanche. You know, even the number of researchers climbed, everyone just said, yes, we want to be part of this. We knew we wanted videos, but then make it into an actual channel and organize the channel into chapters, but also by authors by researchers so if you're particularly enjoying one's perspective you can um, tune into them a podcast just seems like a logical thing to do because more and more students and people are just listening to podcasts when they're walking and stuff so making it more accessible to everyone i think is great for the for this project i think we did quite well tackling everything but as far as update then we're always looking for input and ways to uh, keep it relevant updated and improve it such a tremendous effort and so happy to see that this was the one that our review committee chose to represent significant impact. And I think that says a lot about the way we wanted to make the award uh, more than a, a, a bookish concept as well. And I appreciate the flexibility of having those different components make it useful to other people. What would you say is some encouragement for other people who may want to take on this kind of project? I would say, first and foremost, make it a team effort because the team really is what makes it something special. It was referenced that I would write the chapter. I would write the first draft. Cindy would revise it. It would go to the team and the magic would happen. I always say without the team, it would be a 700 page Word document on my computer. And I guarantee you 31,000 people would not have read a 700 page Word document that was on my computer. So the team is really what makes it come to life. That's really where the ideas come in. If we had looked back and said the amount of work that would go into it, do we want to take this on? It probably would have been terrifying. But because we moved forward through it, everything just led to the next step. It was a lot of work for sure, but it all was logical and it all came together. So walk the path, walk it with other people and definitely take advantage of your team strength. I think I have my pull quote for the article. Thank you very much. Yeah. If you're willing to share, like, what is something that you enjoy doing when you're away from this work? What's something that, that recharges you or at least helps you find balance and especially addressing issues like homelessness? I can start if you want. Yeah. You can tell by the color of my hair that I'm an older member of the team. 
And I have four wonderful grandchildren, two teenagers and then two very young, two and three weeks. I look at them and I think about the world ahead of them. As much as you can recharge when you're interacting with teenagers or babysitting wee ones, I think to myself, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do going forward to make this world a better place. But that's one of the things, that and the fact that I play golf very poorly. Excellent. I, I've been told there's a kayaker in the room. That'd be me? That'd be yeah. I live in Peterborough. You know, we have the Otonabee River and some lakes nearby within driving distance. I live on the dead end street and the river is right at the end of my street. I like to go kayaking or paddleboarding. Water is just calming and it always brings me back to a good place after things are getting stressful. The weather is awesome now, so it's the beginning of the season and I'm looking forward to it because for too many months, kayaking is not enough. And either of the Jameses? I guess for a year-round activity or hobby, I should say, I'm kind of involved with a bit of an electronic music community online. So us putting together music mixes and stuff, that helps me really get back to my zen and such. So that helps me detach away from work and all that. Sounds like work to me, James. So well, if you know me. Well, I'm betting you really <laughs> like it. I do a lot of work within 12-step programs, supporting people just like myself, Narcotics Anonymous. Cocaine or not, I know it sounds similar to what I do, but it allows me to be aware of my history, my background, and where I come from, and enforces that I do not want to go back there. And in my alone time, I cook, I read, I walk, and you know, think think about how grateful I am that I've been able to get to where I am today. Thank you very much for sharing that, James. And uh, Christy, I understand you you are supervising PhD candidates. I have a source. I, I love working with students, and I think students always bring such a passion to the work. And it's, for me, a bit selfish because I get to learn all kinds of other fields that are tied to my own but maybe expansive. It's always amazing to get that student perspective as well. Well, I, I can't thank everybody enough for spending the time with us to, to hear about the Homelessness in Canada OER. And I want to thank everybody listening. This episode of OE Global Voices, that's coming to you from Open Education Global. And for each uh, episode, now I'm a little bit pressured because we have a musician in the room here, but I pick a different musical track. And I found a track today called Welcome Home by an artist named Cambo. And it's licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Share Like License. And you'll hear it when I send you the preview of this uh, episode. This will be on our site, voices.oeglobal.org, and we hope that you engage in follow-up conversations in our OEG Connect community. Now that we have the nominations open for the awards for 2024, we like to say that everybody wins because we surface hundreds of projects through the nomination process, and we want to see more this year. Thank you so much, team, for joining me and putting up with my questions. It was just me very meaningful for us um, to meet you and get to know you a little bit better. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks.